Hey, welcome to the Metabolic Motivation Show. My name is Dan O'Byrne, former metabolically challenged business exec turned metabolism master. And each show, we're going to bring you an empowering expert or message to help you unlock your metabolism so you can lose fat, gain muscle, add energy, and look, feel, and perform your best. So thanks for spending some time with us today. Now, let the show begin. Three, two, one. We are live on the Metabolic Motivation Show, and very excited to um, to have uh, Dr. Ken Knott with us today. Uh, good morning, Doctor. Thank you for coming on today. Good morning. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Well, Doctor Knott, you have a have a very interesting book uh, out that uh, that is called Dangerous Medicine: What Your Doctor Doesn't Know Can Hurt You. Um, what was the, could you tell us the, maybe the, the back, the genesis of the, of your book? Well, overall, it's a, it's a book that dispels myths and rumors and, uh, standards of care that are incorrect based upon myths and rumors. Uh, there's just so many, I wouldn't even know where to start. I suppose I could start with the most important hormone, thyroid. Uh, but the treatment of thyroid is, is just so full of rumors as far as how to treat people uh, that I, I wanted to get to the real basics as far as science and that's what really started me looking um, and I was fortunate enough to be around some people that who I felt were science-based and uh, so I started looking at the at the truth on these matters instead of what we're all taught in medical school and our training so what so what are doctors taught in medical school about the thyroid? Well, we, we get about probably three or four days worth of training in thyroid, and it's the most important uh, hormone in the body. Um, but we're taught that the gold standard test is a TSH. Right. And, and the TSH is so fraught with error and is so misleading uh, but the standard says if you get below a certain level, it's dangerous. It's, it's not dangerous uh, because TSH has no direct bearing on anything except the thyroid. Uh, so when you replace with proper amounts of, of thyroid, uh, your TSH is always going to go down. Uh, one, of the, one of the big myths is that with, um, with low TSH, you get osteoporosis. I tracked that down to an article that was published. I, I forget when it's in my book. It's in the, I believe it was in the 80s. Uh, it was with ladies over the age of 70 who were menopausal. And uh, none of them were taking estradiol, progesterone, or testosterone, the sex hormone. Yes. That prevent, yes. Oste that prevent osteoporosis. So it really had but nothing to do with the thyroid. It <laughs> had nothing to do with the thyroid. And their osteoporosis had nothing to do with the thyroid. And it's one of the biggest myths I have to overcome with people because hyperthyroidism can cause bone loss. Yes. That's Graves' disease. Graves' disease. Um, but hypothyroid can also do the same thing. You can get uh, osteoporosis with hypothyroidism. But having a normal thyroid level is not going to cause osteoporosis. Uh, and, and that's an another area that's misunderstood there are many people that have thyroid resistance and they need a little bit more thyroid than the than the person that doesn't have resistance so you have to know how to treat that it will drive your TSH down but they're more healthy than they've been in years so the standard of care in that area is very questionable yeah fascinating stuff and I think a lot of um, I know in my experience working with obese populations there's that uh, is an area where I think a lot of people have been badly served um, because it's certainly, uh, you know, a really com a complex question. And, it, and many times we were taught it was, just, you know, obesity was just a question of calorie balance and no one was looking at the hormones. And I think we're starting to realize more widely that that's uh, that we need to do that, and that's why I think your book has a great some great information that uh, people should check out. 
Um, let's let's switch hormones if we if we could. I know we could go on uh, for for longer with that one, but uh, let's talk about uh, a problem that faces men these days. That's more and more common, uh, and that would be andropause. Uh, what's been what's been your experience with andropause, and what do you, and what do you what do you see, and what do you do? Well, I have a great deal of experience because every man goes through it. It's a, whether they like to admit it or not. Sure, <laughs> they think that the only the only uh, sex that goes through any type of change like that are, are women that have menopause. Right, that's what we'd like. To, we'd like to tell ourselves <laughs> that. <laughs> well, that's right. That's the caveman in, in us coming out. You know, we we're the, the big protector, and we're never weak. You know. But uh, no, our, our testosterone levels start going down at about the age of 25, and they continue going down the rest of your life until you wake up one day, look in the mirror, and you don't recognize who you see. <laughs> but um, there, there's a lot of myths about testosterone, too. And, and what, what really amazes me is that a naturally occurring hormone, testosterone, is a controlled substance. Now, who had that brilliant idea? Uh, yeah. That was brought about as a result of people abusing it. Uh, just go after the people that abuse it. Don't don't make something a controlled substance that's a naturally occurring compound. Uh, what's next? Air? Yeah. I mean, you know, hey, you can't can't breathe this air over here unless you get a NDC number, a pharmacy number for it. I mean, it's just gotten to be absurd uh, with the government sticking their nose in everything and wanting to control everything. Hey, now when did when did testosterone become a controlled substance? It's been there for several years, and they're they're just really watching it so closely, and it's it's so silly. Uh, it's because it's a life saving hormone for men and women too. Uh, it's necessary to to uh, to optimize your health. Uh, it happens in all men. Uh, it also happens in women after menopause in many cases, uh, but. Testosterone is necessary for muscle growth, uh, for maintenance of muscle, repair, uh, libido, feeling of well-being, uh, the immune system response, uh, all sorts of things testosterone helps with uh, should not be a controlled substance. I guess next will be estrogen and then progesterone and then thyroid. We ought, we ought to control that too. Right. Uh, you know, they're really dangerous. They're, they're not dangerous if they're used correctly. Uh, and since it's a prescription item, uh, doctors should know how to use all of those hormones. Unfortunately, the training doesn't uh, help most doctors learn how to use these properly. Um, but still, uh, why controlled? That, that's that's absolutely absurd. Yeah, that makes a great point. Um, so this brings to mind a question for um, just looking at your looking at your website. Uh, you've got a some great lot of wonderful material there. Um, would you characterize yourself as an anti aging physician, or or how would you do? How would you characterize what you do? I'm pretty much an integrative physician. I'm trained in physical medicine and board certified in physical medicine, and went to the top co uh, residency in the country at Ohio State University. They say the Ohio State University. Right. Um, so, so I was trained properly, traditionally, and I got some of the same things that we all get. Uh, we're all inundated with these myths, and uh, we're becoming desensitized because of TV saying, oh, you can die from this drug, but it's okay. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, if I'd seen something like that, that on TV, my mom and dad had seen something like that, they would have avoided it like the plague. But now we've become so desensitized to this garbage on TV, uh, allowing these companies, Big Pharma, to advertise. They shouldn't even be allowed to advertise, in my opinion. Uh, but we, we don't even think anything about um, being paralyzed or dying or uh, having this reaction or that reaction, liver problems, on and on and on, cancer. Um, because it happens with virtually all these drugs. It's, it's just amazing what we have accepted. Right. No, that's a great point. So you're, you're speaking to the, the warning labels that, are, that they hurriedly <laughs> pass by the, the, uh, on, our, on our television screens every night. And, uh, and you're right. I think we totally um, have become desynthesized or synthesized to that. And, and 
Yeah, good point. Well, the, the, the way they throw you off is that the actors on there are all smiling. Right. Everybody's happy. They're all happy when they're dying. You yes. know, well, I'm going to die and just smile. Uh, it's just it's counterintuitive. Uh, but they keep putting this, this nonsense on TV, uh, uh, and everybody just doesn't pay attention anymore to the, to the side effects. Right. And, right. and they're getting a bigger and bigger and bigger hold. Big Pharma is because there are other companies out there that can make, say, bioidentical hormones that I use, compounding pharmacies. Yes. And there's a concerted effort to put them out of business. And it just angers me to no end that they're trying to do this. This is the way pharmacy got started in this country. People would make things up for, for doctors on their prescription. Now all we do, do is put a brand name. Right. I mean, we're not smart enough to write down the ingredients, so we have to put a brand name and trust that it doesn't kill your patient. Of course, there was a warning, so if they die, it's okay. Right, right. So the legal, uh, the 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 legal part is they've got their backs covered, and uh, certainly have the <laughs> the legal teams, I'm sure, to uh, to to go to battle as well. Uh, well, doctor, let's let's change gears a little bit. And what, just looking at your looking, going back to your book again, what about uh, a similar or related topic about human growth hormone? What can you tell us um, about that? Well, for some reason, the uh, the my esteemed colleagues who are the experts have um, have found found it necessary to promote uh, a false message to the public that it causes cancer. There's absolutely no evidence in the literature that it causes cancer of any form. The only study that I was able to find where growth hormone was tied to cancer was the cadaver-derived uh, growth hormone. Mm -hmm. We right. quit doing that years ago, to over 20 years ago, because it was causing neurological diseases in, in kids. So we came up with the recombinant DNA synthesized growth hormone and there's no study ever showing that it causes cancer, but never let it be said that you want to confuse an expert with facts. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so I would just I would just ask them, please show me the study. And I've never gotten a study in the mail, a fax, an email to me. Uh, just don't get them because there are none. It's the same with testosterone and heart disease. Some of the bogus studies that come out about testosterone causing heart disease are just pseudoscience. Right, and, and my colleagues that have been in uh, cardiac research for years uh, look at those studies and say, how can they publish something like that? Right. If you plug, if you plug the numbers in on testosterone, the, the numbers themselves disprove their theory. But everybody just buys it. So the New York Times, you know, the big medical journal of New York Times yes. and yes. L.A. Times, uh, the me medical journal and, and well-researched New York Times, and L.A. Times comes out uh, saying that testosterone causes heart disease. It is a false message. And, and that's the kind of stuff that goes on with growth hormone. It causes diabetes. No, it does not. It causes a transient incre increase in blood sugar. That's all it does. You eat a Snickers bar and it causes a transient increase in blood sugar. It doesn't mean it causes diabetes. But this is a transient increase. That doesn't stay. Yes. But the experts who don't want to be confused by facts again are out here uh, parading around, scaring everybody to death, saying, oh, it's going to cause cancer, going to cause this, going to cause that. So they want to control that too. You only can use it in adults who are growth hormone, uh, hormone deficient or children who have a uh, short stature. Uh, the, the experts want to maintain control. Right. So do you think Why? that... I don't well, that, that kind of leads me, I would, my question, my next question was going to be, why is, is there, uh, as far as motives go, is there, a cons is this effort to, uh, to, to maintain these myths, is it done for control? Is it do done because, you know, we don't, someone doesn't want to admit they were wrong or is it, uh, or, or for some other reason or, or all of the above? Uh, I I think the two you mentioned are, are right there with everything else, but the biggest factor is money. Wow. Anytime you have controversy like this, follow the money and you'll find out where this all starts. Look at it like this. If you keep people healthy, they're going to need less drugs. Yes. So who benefits by selling more drugs? Sure, the pharmaceutical industry. Who gives a grant? 
Who gives the grants to medical schools? There we go. It's pharmaceutical industry. So who has two representatives, who has two uh, uh, people on their staff to talk to representatives in Congress and the Senate, two for every representative in, in our federal government? Who has that? Pharmaceutical big pharma. industry. <laughs> They have they have a big uh, a big influence. They have a lot of money, and they're making more. And they've per persuaded everyone they need to be on our national TV stations every night, fifteen or twenty times, to inundate us with this this information, telling us that what what they give us will kill us, and we're desensitized. But we still buy it because the doctors are out here saying, "Oh well." They've told you you're going to die, maybe, so here, just take it. You probably won't, but if you have problems with your liver or kidneys, I mean, you know, hey, that's just one of the things about it. It's just insane, but it just keeps happening. And so at the, sa and at the same time, it, it, for people who are maybe just sometimes people come onto these things a little late or may not – so if we have a, let's just make up a hypothetical case, sometimes maybe a case study, um, if we could. Maybe a, if we could imagine a, a typical 45-year-old uh, sedentary American male uh, who comes to you and he's presenting, you know, typical symptoms of, uh, of being sedentary, of eating a standard American uh, diet of processed foods. Uh, he probably has, uh, he's probably, he would be overweight. He would have a uh, complaint of lack of energy, lack of motivation, uh, lack of, uh, of sex drive. Uh, what would, now what would, let's, let's contrast if we could the, you know, the, the conventional approach versus what, uh, an, in, an integrative approach might be. Well, the conventional approach, he's probably depressed, so let's put him on an SSRI. Right, so okay? Prozac or something like uh, that. Let's, let's make sure we get him on that. And he's probably a little anxious, so let's put him on uh, something to calm his nerves. And he can't sleep, so let's by all means give him a sleep medication. So his cholesterol Yeah, his cholesterol's up, uh, and, and doctors in the past used to be pretty good, and they knew that when... Cholesterol was up, usually your thyroid was down, so they would know to give him thyroid or at least check the right test, not the TSH, but the free T3. So they'd give him thyroid, but they would probably, uh, in, in, they would know, to, the doctors in the past would know to do that, but doctors today wouldn't know that. So doctors today would put him on a, uh, a liver toxic drug, uh, statin, where his joints hurt, he has muscle pain, he has weakness, he feels bad. But got to get that cholesterol down. Has nothing to do with heart disease, and and it, that's another myth. Nothing to do with it. It's a study came out back in the in the late sixties, early seventies. Ansel Keys, the six country study was bogus. Very bogus. He cherry -picked, he cherry picked the data, and he to make it worse, he did another study called the seven country study. He said did the same darn thing, and it's it has been disproved since. But everybody jumped on that low fat bandwagon. And that, that's been the way it's gone ever since. And the drug companies have billions of reasons uh, to not to dispel the myth. It's called money. Billions of dollars every year made in profit uh, for all these people on these, these terrible drugs uh, in, in, in error. They should not be on these things. The only, the only condition that... Uh, uh, that should be treated with those things is is maybe familial hyperlipidemia where the blood gets so thick, uh, but otherwise people don't need statins. I take people off of statins every day. But anyway, getting back to your your question, uh, when you check a man's testosterone, the the values out there are pretty much wrong. They're too low because they take men in your same age group. And says, you're normal for your age. Says, but, I, you know, I don't have any sex drive. I, I'm losing muscle mass. I'm getting fat around the middle. and I, I just don't have a good feeling about myself. Oh, well, you're normal for your age. And they check the total testosterone when, in fact, that means very little. You have to check the free level. You check the free level. Even that might be in their normal range. But the normal ranges that are given by labs consider a sick population for the most right. part. Not, a, not an optimal level. It's not an optimal level, and, and 
doctors don't know what those optimal levels are so with what, anything. So what is the optimal level that, that, uh, you, that you, from your experience, would be recommended? Well, for free testosterone, I like to see uh, a man have a free testosterone at least over 100. 100, uh, I, I believe we measured in picograms per uh, deciliter, if I'm not mistaken. It could be something. Uh, they measure everything differently to keep us all confused, but I, I have it on a chart. I can't remember all that. <laughs> well, that's what the charts are for. I mean, That's right. But total levels, see, don't matter. You can have a, you can have a total testosterone of... 2,000, uh, but your free level is 50 right? because your binding globulin is so high. Uh, does that mean you're optimized? No, it doesn't mean you're optimized at all. So you have to get the binding globulin down. And uh, what amazes me is doctors don't check estrogen in men. You have to check it uh, because it competes with the receptor site. It can cause feminizing qualities to the man. Sure, they can grow that. breast tissue and hips sure, and that. legs or thighs and, and uh, not good, not good stuff. Yeah, you can you can see that with um, quite uh, quite readily if you go to any any um, any Gold's Gym type place where you get a lot of ex bodybuilders or or even long term bodybuilders and you see the what they call the bitch tits and it's pretty nasty. Yeah, looking. Uh, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and you have to guard against that. That that's not very that's not very nice. It's not very aesthetically pleasing, I should say. Um, but the, the difference is doctors are scared to treat people because of all these myths. Right. Oh, it's going to cause heart attack. Oh, it's going to cause a stroke. It's going to do this. It's going to do that. It's based upon nonsense and, and pseudoscience. But that's what ruins our present medical system. That's the only way it can be controlled. You can't control something with facts. You have to make stuff up. Right, And when you make stuff up and it's taught to fledgling uh, 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 minds, you know, people in they're new in medicine, they're going to believe it all. I did. We all do. Because we reached the epitome of our education and never would think that we were taught anything wrong. Actually, the people that teach it don't know they're teaching the wrong thing because they were taught wrong too. Right. But it takes a long time to change this. It's like turning an oil tanker around. You know, it takes forever. Right. And it's, it's going to happen, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. But this may be a good start. We need to get those drug companies off TV, first of all. That's the first thing. So that the only people that know about the drugs are the doctors, not the, not the patients. If they want to read about it on the Internet, fine, go for it. But as far as putting it on TV and inundating our minds with this stuff, it's, it's just wrong. Yeah, the the repetition of you know repetition is the, uh, the one of the greatest techniques of advertising and persuasion, and they've certainly got that going. In fact, that's probably why over I'm, I'm over in Spain, um, and uh, here in Europe, it's actually uh, illegal to advertise pharmaceuticals on uh, on TV. So um, it should. Be. Yeah, I think it used they got to be. That right. Yeah, I think it used yeah. to be in the U.S. I mean, there's other problems here, uh, but. Uh, that's one area that I feel good about here, and uh, uh, so let's let's see what else we can uh, jump into here. There's so much good stuff in your book. We're gonna ha probably have to come back and do a part two on this interview. So uh, well, let's just I'm just gonna stick with the table of contents here. Uh, so you've also got a chapter. I think it's chapter three where you talk about women and hormones. Uh, what, yeah. uh, what can you give us a summary for women out there? Yeah, you know, that that's pretty well known and accepted. It's called menopause. But uh, women start with that earlier than most people think, and their hormones get unbalanced, and they get bitchy, and they get uh, irritable and uh, depressed and all these things, when, when in fact, if you check their levels, they're usually low in one area or the other. They get sometimes estrogen dominant. And the one big factor that has caused a, a problem in the past 10 years is that silly study called the Women's Health Initiative Study. It was about a product called PrimPro. It wasn't about hormones. Right. It's not about human hormones. It's about progestin, which is a look-alike. It's, it's a chemical. It's not a hormone. But even doctors just use progestin and progesterone interchangeably. That's how little they know about it. Right. Um, and the other one is horse estrogens. There is an estradiol in it, which is a human estrogen, 
but a lot of the estrogens in that compound are horse estrogens. They have no place in the human body. But it's, uh, it's been around for years. Uh, they, can, they keep selling it, even though there was an increased incidence of stroke and heart attack and cancer, they keep selling that stupid product. That's how desensitized we are. Wow. And when women come in and say, aren't you going to give me primer? And I say, are you going to have a cult? <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. I, I, it was a joke. Yeah. I, I ask them if they're going to have a if they're going to have a cult because that's horse estrogen. Oh, a cult. Really? Okay, okay, I got you. I understood cult <laughs> and not cult. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm, but the, the the whole point with that study is yes, there's an increased incidence with Primpro. Right. There's never been a study on naturally occurring bioidentical hormones. Never. And you know why? There's no money in it. No money. Yes. There's no money to study bioidentical hormones because what they're going to find, in my opinion, is there's no problem. But they don't want to do that study because that would show beyond the shadow of a doubt something that I think I already know. Bioidentical hormones are far superior to what most doctors give women. So if they get on bioidentical hormones, that's exactly what they should be on. And I usually give them to women in uh, postmenopause in a cream or a gel or a lozenge twice a day. The drug companies recommend once a day. Why? The half-life on those uh, hormones is 12 hours. Mm -hmm. So they want them feeling well just half the day. Right, I would point. think they'd want them feel. <laughs> I would think they'd want them feeling good the whole day. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of surprising because they would also be consuming more of the, you know, more of the of the drug company's product. So it's they, maybe they just they just don't know that. It's, or they don't, I don't well, know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm seriously thinking about writing a, another book called Band-Aid Society, yeah. where we cover everything up and don't treat the cause of anything, you know, and that's yeah. exactly what's going on. Uh, so if you're depressed because of low, uh, low estrogen or low testosterone, heck, let's give you a SSRI or a tricyclic to cover it up. Right, uh, If right. you can't sleep. If you can't sleep, let's not look at your adrenals or your thyroid. Shoot, let's give you a very expensive sleep medication. You know, I could go on and on and on, and you know where I'm coming from. Sure. Oh, totally, totally, totally. Well, Doctor Nutt, let me let me throw in a um, a couple of a couple of topics that have come up with a lot of uh, uh, in the past that uh, maybe you can shed some light on and uh, typical problems. For example, for for couples, uh, let's talk about fertility if we could. Uh, for couples who are uh, out there who are thinking about, hey, I want to, you know, want to conceive. Let's get pregnant. Let's, uh, you know, let's have some healthy, happy babies. And they're finding it a little difficult. Um, any could any tips you can give us? Well, one key, and and this is something I've found over the years. And I learned this from uh, a fellow by the name of Jacques Hertog. Uh, he's an endocrinologist in, uh, in uh, Belgium, and his daughter is still there, Therese, uh, one of the most brilliant young ladies I've ever met in my life. Uh, I learned this from Jacques. He said, um, uh, a lot of infertility problems are due to low thyroid. Really? And if you replace their thyroid, they better get ready to call themselves mama. And I've seen it in my own, <laughs> and I've seen it in my own practice. Uh, because the thyroid gets checked improperly, the doctors miss it. They're missing it five out of six times. That tells you how bad wow. it is. Five out of six times. Five out of six. Because they're using the wrong five. marker. Is that right? They're using the wrong test. Wrong but test. They, they, you know, I'm not here to pick on doctors. I'm, it's a medical system itself. The doctors, in most cases, are really good people. They really do want to help. And they want to stick to their training because they think it is correct. The problem is, in some cases, it's not correct. And thyroid is one of those areas where it's blatantly obvious that it's incorrect. But if they miss the thyroid dysfunction and they don't give proper uh, thyroid, and I use desiccated thyroid. I don't use that synthetic T4 that the drug companies want you to use. Right. Uh, because if you have a conversion defect from 4 to 3, from T4 to T3, then you're still hypothyroid, but the test will never show it, not the test that they do. Right. So you have to do the right test. But 
in these ladies who are having a problem with conceiving, first of all, find out, is it the husband? Now, if it's a husband, that's a different situation. Uh, but it, in, in many cases, it, it is the lady. You put them on thyroid, their fertility increases, and they have kids. And they can carry them to term. Uh, a lot of that, a great deal of that is due to low thyroid. That's missed. Wow, that's a very, very interesting thing that I think uh, many people have not heard before. Uh, anything else on fertility you could, you could add to well, for, for the guys, you know, I, I see it in uh, ex-athletes and uh, the people that have abused uh, anabolic steroids, <clears throat> and we try to bring them around with uh, drugs like Clomid, which is uh, used in women for infertility, uh, but it can also be used in men to increase FSH and LH. Uh, that increases sperm and testosterone. Another, uh, another preparation is a female hormone called HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, and it will also increase FSH, which increases sperm count, and LH, which increases um, testosterone. Okay. So that's the way to deal with, with, with the guy. Now, in some cases, their thyroid is fine in the ladies, and there's some other problem. I'm not saying it's all thyroid, by all means. Uh, there's nothing that's a panacea for mankind, nothing. Right. right. Uh, these are just instances where it helps many times. That's all. Sure, sure. So you, so being, so it's important to be a uh, a health detective as and know the right test and and to discover the. So what you're really talking about, if I, if I get your, uh, I think I can. It's pretty evident that uh, you're talking about dealing with causes and not with putting a band, not putting a band aid on symptoms. Exactly. Exactly. And if, if a lady's infertile, by all means, check her thyroid, but check it properly. If the T3, uh, the free portion of the T3 is low, she's hypothyroid. It's just that simple. Now, could you have a woman, for example, a lot of times we associate, uh, commonly associate low thyroid with uh, being overweight. But uh, would you, have you seen, would, could you also see a woman who's not overweight, who's maybe even thin and, and athletic, but still has low thyroid? Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the most uh, remarkable cases I've ever seen was a ga gal whose thyroid was low. Uh, she was of normal, uh, actually she was a little thin, small lady, but she had all these little scaly lesions over her whole body. Mm -hmm. uh, and it made me think thyroid because thyroid so important for skin. Right. I put her on thyroid, and those things began to disappear for the first time in her life, and she was in her 50s. Wow. She says, I don't believe this. Why didn't somebody find this before now? Her free T3 was low, regardless of what the TSH showed. I put her on the thyroid, and within a month, those lesions started falling off her until she lost them all. It had never been like that her whole life. She was amazed. Uh, I was a little amazed, too, that it happened that quickly, but uh, that's just an idea of how important the thyroid is. Yeah, well, that's a dramatic change. So, so you're, what you're saying, people, is to look at, is we should be testing the T3. Is that right? The free T3. The free, free T3. T3. Yeah, not the, not the T3 uptake, not the total T3, but the free T3. The free T3. That's T3. the one that can bind to the receptor site. Right, that's... Very, very interesting stuff. Wow, this is, there's a lot of, uh, lot of great stuff. Uh, do we have time for, for one more topic? Certainly. Certainly? Okay. Well, let's, I, know, I know that you, uh, on your website there was a mention of, um, in, that you, about balancing, uh, balancing the uh, neurotransmitters and uh, naturally, and, uh, and you know, this might, might, we might be talking about dopamine or, or other... Um, other neurotransmitters. Uh, can you talk about uh, about that topic? Yes, yes. Um, because of many factors, uh, not the least of which is toxins in our environment, our neurotransmitters can get disrupted. We don't make the right neurotransmitters. They get unbalanced. We get depressed. We get anxious. We have no attention uh, uh, for tasks. We can't concentrate. All these sort of things. So we test those neurotransmitters uh, directly through, through blood testing. 
uh, and we compare them to what we consider optimal levels and we can actually give nutraceuticals which are vitamins, minerals, sure. uh, supplements uh, to change those levels. Um, so instead of sending them to Dr. X who gives, puts everybody on an antidepressant, we actually try to see which ones are not balanced right. and correct that and they don't need the antidepressant or the anxiolytic agent. Right. That's so, a, it's, it's, it's really phenomenal. It's, it's new stuff, but um, it's something I'm learning more and more about. And every, every bit I learn, I become more fascinated. You can even teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. Well, that's, oh, that's, <laughs> that's wonderful. That's great to see. Hey, if you, if you stop learning, you start dying. That's what my grandfather always said. And, uh, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And so for anyone, would that be something uh, that could be another a chapter? On your current book, I don't know if you have a, is that something? I don't. That's I don't. And that, I'm going to put that in my next book. The other thing that's important that, that I wanted to mention to you is testing of foods, food sensitivities. Yes. Uh, very, very important. And, and certainly the missing link in some cases with people who cannot lose weight. We had a lady... Oh, it's been about three months now. We did what's called an ALCAT test. Mm -hmm. uh, she was highly sensitive to apples. And guess what her daily snack was? Apples. An apple. <laughs> <laughs> she could not lose weight. <laughs> so we put her on apples. Or put, put, took her away from apples. I'm sorry. We didn't put her on apples. Took her away from apples, said no more apples, and she lost 13 pounds in two weeks, and she has continued to lose and has now lost over 30 pounds. First time ever in, in 20 years. And we've had her on strict diets. We've done everything we know to do. She's on thyroid. Uh, but now she feels better than she has in 20 years. Wow, that's a it, great story. It's one of those missing link things that we never think about. Hey, that, that, that could be another title. That could be your subtitle. You know, Band-Aid yeah. Medicine, the missing links that, uh, that I've learned <laughs> in 50 years. Yeah, or whatever. Actually, I don't know if you've. How long have you been practicing medicine, doctor? Uh, thirty-eight years. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit over fifty. But who knows? You'll probably make it another twelve more years, and you'll be at fifty. <laughs> That's right. Very good. Straight. Good stuff. Yeah, I, uh, I began practicing. Well, let's see. In in seventy seven. So yeah, thirty-eight years. So yeah. that was, that was, uh, and, and what did you, you were, that was right. Let's see if I remember as a young guy, that would have been just about the time Carter was out and Reagan was, came in. Is that right? Uh, I think Reagan no, came no, no, in no, right actually, after that. No, Carter came in right at 76. Okay. So you started yeah, in the yeah. Carter administration and then kept forward. Yeah. Um, hey, well, let me let me throw one more topic in there, if I might, J just for for anyone t speaking about prevention of diseases or, or treatment of um, or trying to manage it, manage diseases. Uh, there's a lot of people that have pro are dealing with cancer and that they maybe they've they're um, you know, they're doing the conventional treatments. They're doing OK, but they're really worried about having a relapse or, you know, having it come back. Is there any anything you can share from from your experience with as far as dealing with you know dealing with cancer trying to boost our immune systems and get everything working correctly well first of all is thyroid you know I keep going back to that but it is so important without proper levels of thyroid your immune system is is going to be deficient and by all means you need an efficient immune system if you have had cancer uh, Optimizing all hormones is, is, is probably the best thing to do, but there's so much controversy about it because of those studies that I was talking yes. about and, and the silly things that come out on testosterone. I remember in medical school, we were taught never to give someone with prostate cancer or atherosclerotic vascular disease, which is heart disease, yes. testosterone. Right. Testosterone oh, that, myth, because that myth is like, really big. Because it's like throwing gasoline on a fire. That's what they taught all of us. I believed it. I believed it for years. Sure. And then I came across Jacques Hertog, who I was talking about a while ago. He says, that's nonsense. And now we have another fellow that heads up urology at Harvard. His name is Abraham Morgenthaler. He has said without any hesitation, 
Testosterone has nothing to do with prostate cancer. As a matter of fact, it he may treats, protect you. You know what? I was in, I was in touch with him last week. We have we have not set up an interview, but I noticed one of his tenets is that he actually tr treats prostate cancer with testosterone. Yes, yes, but it's so so against what we were taught that sure. it's it's a just a different it's a paradigm shift, and but the urologists won't adopt it, even though <laughs> even though it's it's most likely the truth. And like I say, people, uh, scientists don't want to be confused by facts. Right. You want to go on myths and keep practicing that way. My God, what if we went on myths the rest of, of time? We'd never have any progress. Yes. There yeah. is a place for facts. <laughs> yeah, it's very, you know, it's one of the things from, from people on the outside of um, who, who, before you, if you don't spend a lot of time, it's hard to imagine how politicized um, science can be, or at least the, the acceptance of science. And I tell my family, I've Great. got, you know, it's almost like going, it's almost like you invite, you have a dinner party at your house and you invite, you know, some Obama fans on the one side and then you, you invite some tea party folks from the other side to the same dinner. And then, <laughs> you know, you can get the same thing in science. Uh, in my experience, Fire, fireworks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's just amazing how many myths are out there that are considered fact. And that's that's the main thing I want my book to do. I want people to do some critical thinking and you know, how can natural naturally occurring hormones all of a sudden cause all these problems in old people who don't have them in their system? Right. I mean, the people that should have problems with testosterone are the young boys. And and the girls uh, during uh, during their uh, productive years should have all the problems with estrogen and progesterone, not the other way around. So why do we get all these diseases later in life? Oh, it took a long time to develop. Oh, nonsense! Abraham Nor Morgenthaler knows better than that, and he said he, ta he even talked about it in his book. He talks about it in lectures, and I mentioned it to my urology friends. Oh, I don't know, you know. Uh, it, it's just it is. It is just hardwired into us, I suppose. Well, it's not hardwired. It's conditioned into conditioned us. Conditioned in, yeah. And we, yeah. Believe, we yeah. believe all that. Sure. We well, repetition. Yeah, if you look, if you look at the, uh, principle, the principles of propaganda and persuasion, I mean, you know, advertising, all of those. I mean, repetition is a big, big one. The other, then the other thing is you have, a, uh, you have the fear of, uh, of if something goes wrong, you're going to be liable. And, this, you know, the liability is a huge issue. My, my father's an attorney. I grew up with, with liability lawsuits at the dinner table. You know? he, was on the good <laughs> he was on the good side, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you know, it, it, it goes back to a guy I mentioned in my book. So this is nothing new, this, uh, this marketing method. Uh, Goebbels was very good at it oh, yeah. in, in Nazi Germany. Uh, and the guys now, you know, if you want to sell a product, get these guys that are advertising for uh, the pharmaceutical industry, they'll sell ice to an Eskimo. Sure. Uh, because if they can sell dangerous drugs to the public, they can do anything. And that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it <laughs> is, it's, it's a crazy world we live in. But it's good to well, let... It, Go ahead. The FDA has two has two uh, cha charges. One is to make sure the drug works. They are very good at doing that. The other is to protect the public. They don't do that. And everybody says FDA approved. So what? It's approved because it works, but it's not approved for whether it kills you or not. Because they do nothing about that. You have to kill several thousand people before they even think about taking it off the market. Look at Vioxx. Right. Look at Baycol. It was a cholesterol-lowering agent. They killed 100,000 people with that. Amazing. They killed thirty or 40,000 with the Vioxx. Uh, so finally, they had to step in because the evidence was so overwhelming. They had to do something against their buddies over at the pharmaceutical industry. They're in their hip pocket is basically what it is. Yeah, there's some... It, it's if, a shame. You know, I'll, I'll share a quick, a, a quick anecdote out of a little kind of disconnected but uh, I was on a uh, was on a private tour uh, in London um, and I heard uh, from a, from a tour guide who was talking about a, a simple thing about sociology and looking at power structures in civilizations and uh, he, he gave the example you simply look at the largest building in the in the city and you can sort of know or 
at least the series of, the, or, or maybe the top five, and you can, and then you say who owns that, and you can sort of see where the power is. And this goes back to the Roman Empire: who has the biggest buildings? Who has now? If you take that and you go to Washington, and aside from you know the Senate, the Congress, uh, if you look at the largest buildings built in the last twenty years, you know who who occupies them. Gee, I would never guess. Probably Big Pharma. Well, the the the, farm, the lobbyists who are working for Big Pharma. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, insurance companies, banks, and and yeah, pharmaceutical there you go. industry. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And, and I would challenge anyone who's listening. I mean, don't take my word for it. Next time you're in Washington, just walk around and and look at them. You know, it's it's quite obvious. Uh, I spent a summer at. Very true. I spent a summer uh, working for a for a congressman. Uh, my uncle, I have an uncle who's a politician, and it was kind of a favor to him. I think, not that I was any uh, any great asset, but they, you know, it's kind of a favor thing. And so I was up there. We had invitations every, even on Monday night. There were a dozen invitations to go to lobbyist functions, and uh, this this particular congressman didn't really want to go. He was like, "Hey, that's just more work." I'm going home. And he said, you guys can go. You know, all we had to do was go and say, hey, I come, you know, I'm just uh, wanted to let you know that uh, our congressman was unable to make it. He sends his, you know, his best wishes. And hey, where's the bar? <laughs> you know, this was as a college student. <laughs> and it was just, oh, uh, yeah. it was, it was, this was, you know, this was in the night, this was in the mid 80s. And uh, I'm sure it's gotten progressively, uh, <laughs> progressively more intense. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway well that's exactly how it works uh, and it's it's a real shame because the public is is uh, I don't know it's like a bunch of sheep and, and the doctors aren't much better because they ask no questions yeah they, they don't question uh, they don't question the person that can't sleep crawling in the office no energy they put them on an ant, uh, antidepressant instead of looking at their thyroid I mean it's just insanity uh, and, and it makes me think there's not really many good doctors out there because of the poor training that we have. Well, here's another, here's another thing that you may have this in your book. I have not been, got through all of it, but do you know the, the, the Latin root of the word doctor? Uh, no. What is it, actually? It's, you know, and, and I may be butchering the pronunciation, but it's, some, it's, 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 it's well, it's sense. very similar, if I recall correctly, but it's something like doctore or... But it basically, what it means is to teach in its, right, in its right. Latin root. It means to teach. And that's kind of the, you know, this is the way doctors used to, used to be. And I think what you're doing is, and hats off to you, because I think you're doing, you know, what, uh, what you're meant to be here on this earth doing. And, um, and, and I have doctors in my family, and I'm like you. I'm not, you know, I think a lot of them are sort of victims of circumstances. They think they're doing the right thing. They, you know, they try to stay up on their on, on what's become an increasingly narrow field or or specialties, but they oftentimes, you know, one I have one one doctor cousin of mine. His joke is, you know, well, in, uh, within ten years we're going to have a specialist for the thumb. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's, and and he's exactly. not, and he's not going to be able to work on or understand, you know, the the uh, the middle finger. You know, or the pinky, That's right. you know, it's going to be that. And so as you push these, as you push the doctors into, into a more specialized role, they're more, they go deeper and deeper and they're, you know, and they're unable to, to have time to think about, you know, a lot exactly. of the, all these topics, you know, that seems, that's sort of my, you know, my uh, perspective, but uh, so, let, well, we're so graduating, let's, we're graduating a lot of technicians. Right. That's, that's, that's a great way to put it. So what would be, for any doctors out there who are listening, who are thinking, you know, hey, I know there's a problem, what, for, what, what can they do, you know, when they're stuck in the rat race? Uh, what would be your suggestions to a doctor who wants to start educating himself and, you know, in, in the way that, you know, to get to, to learn some of this stuff? Apart from reading, of course, read your book would be a great start. And anything else you would suggest? <laughs> That would be a good start. There, there, there are a couple of organizations around. Um, you know, Terry Hertog uh, runs a group of uh, physicians that deal with endocrino endocrinology. Uh, the Broder Barnes Foundation used to be a very good source. They haven't had a meeting in seven years. I think they ran out of funds. Um, but the other way is to get out of that rat race of insurance. 
uh, I'm, I'm giving a talk in two months on concierge medicine to a group of doctors in New Orleans uh, because they asked me to. They want to know how to get into this just to help the patient instead of having to uh, please the insurance company right. or go by their gut. You know, the insurance company has about as much cause to direct medical care as I do uh, building a, a, a condo on the moon. You know, it's, it should be none of their business. Right. But they direct it by, by controlling the purse strings. So if doctors really want to be independent of that, they have to divorce themselves from insurance. And that's hard to do. But it can be done. Um, but the, um, uh, the other groups, uh, probably the environmental medicine group is a good place. ACAM is another good group. Uh, they tend to focus primarily upon uh, chelation, uh, which works, by the way. Um, but it will lead you to meet other people who will be able to teach you things. I was just very fortunate being able to spend time with the Heritogs, and I found them through the Broder Barnes Foundation. Broder Barnes was an endocrinologist back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He wrote the book called Hypothyroidism, the Unsuspected Illness, and it is true today as it was then. He predicted an epidemic of hypothyroidism, and it's here now. And that's why I say that. I've seen it happen myself because the testing methods are wrong. Right. But, um, I would start with reading the book, seriously, uh, and spending time with people like me. And there are other people like me uh, that, that really try to look at facts and not are so swayed by the opinions that we get directly from our training programs. Well, that's uh, great, uh, great information. Dr. Knott, thank you so much for, uh, for spending time. I know we've, got a, we've gone longer than normal, and uh, really appreciate that. Uh, w when do you think you may uh, have your next book out? Any, any timetable? It, takes a, it took me about a year to write this one. It'll probably take at least another year. Okay. So yeah, I would say probably six, 2016. 2016. Well, that, that will be a great, a great excuse to have you back on the show and... Uh, uh, our, hopefully we'll have our, we'll have our numbers much higher, uh, and, uh, I think this will be a popular interview and, uh, look forward to staying in touch with you and it'll be, uh, be a pleasure. And now for, for people who might want to get in touch with you, um, who, as you were, you were mentioning, you know, someone who might want to consult with you, what would be, what's the best way to get in touch with you? I just go to the website. The number is on there. It's Ken G as in golf. Not K N O T T M D dot com. Wonderful. So that's my website, Ken G not M D dot com. Uh, and our number, our contact number, and email, everything's on there. Wonderful. And your book, Dangerous yeah. Medicine What Your Doctor Doesn't Know Can Hurt You, uh, highly recommended. Is that, uh, that can be, they can find that on your website. Is that all, on other sources? Is other, uh, there you go. That's what it looks like, and uh, it's available in all ebooks uh, form, uh, and it is available on the website, uh, Amazon, all of those. Yeah, just go to the website, and there's a link there that you can hit. Excellent, excellent, Doctor Knott. It's been a great pleasure. Uh, thanks again, it's my and uh, and good luck in, down in New Orleans. I've got family down there myself. Get you uh, some. Uh, do you like if you might if you like the the food there? Um, uh, I can oh, I do. Okay, well, you're gonna have a, you'll be in, in for a treat. <laughs> I'm sure they'll I'm sure they'll give you. You probably I was gonna say I can give you some tips, but I think you'll be in good hands if you're <laughs> if you've been invited to speak. So. <laughs> yeah, it'll, it'll be nice. It'll be very nice. Thank All you right. so much. Wonderful. We'll be in touch. I will let you know when uh, when Rachel gets this uh, gets this process. We've got a little bit of a backlog on our video. Sure. On our, but we'll let you know, and maybe you can tweet it out and, and share that with your social media people and. Uh, and uh, as they say, a rising tide lifts all ships. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Take care. All right. Hey, before you go, three quick things. Uh, first, if you like this video, please share it. Second, if you'd like to empower yourself on a regular basis, check out all the uh, free information we have over at Metabolic Motivation. Dot com. And thirdly, if you'd like to fast track your own progress so you can look better, feel better, and perform better, 
we are now offering free 15-minute uh, phone consults to answer your biggest question. And uh, all you have to do is go to metabolicmotivation.com and uh, just click on the Contact Us button. So that's all for now. Thanks again and uh, talk to you soon.